Hello and welcome to episode 12.5 of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. For this recording, I got to speak with the inestimable Piers Taylor, architect, writer, teacher and TV presenter, about his work, the journey to it, its approach and meaning. And so what I did when I built this studio was just have a chat with some people that lived in, in the edges of the woods, my neighbour, a few people who were just kind of, you know, ordinary, rural, resourceful people who didn't care about architecture, didn't care about making, didn't have any interest in, in the way that we were supposed to do things. And we just kind of started a conversation around, I might take these trees out and use them to build a building and what would it be like? And, and consequently, this building was built by people who had no regard for the kind of authority of how a stud is supposed to be set out. But there was a system put in place by the trees which took out that were cut to a certain dimension because it made sense because of the trees we had. They then just fitted a building around it with me and the studs are at 600 centres, 200 centres sometimes, 500 centres other times. There were bits of bracing in strange places that made absolute sense to them. And that was the system that allowed this studio, I would say the language of it, at a fairly detailed level to be collectively discovered. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm talking today to Piers Taylor. Uh, Piers, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rose. Thanks for inviting me. I'm Piers Taylor. And I guess I never thought I would be an architect. I, I, you know, I was a I was a wayward child and I got thrown out of school repeatedly. I have no A-levels. Um, I don't really have any G, are they GCSEs either. In fact, I, have, I probably have a couple of GCSEs. I have no A-levels. And I and I, I didn't think architecture was something I could do or would do and I you know I, I guess when I was a kid or even a teenager I didn't even really know what architecture was so it's kind of surprising I guess you know 30 odd years later I've I've wound up as an architect but I in a way I I don't feel defined by being an architect um with a capital A but I am I am an architect and it's great to to chat to you about some of the things that we have been discussing, um, you know, which is, I think, the sort of fringes of practice and what everyday practice means and what happens to architecture when it doesn't have a capital A. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good point to start on, like what does happen to architecture when it doesn't have, have a capital A? I think that's, um, but you've done a PhD, you've run a very successful mm-hmm. practice. Um, how would you define invisible studio? Why is it an invisible studio? What does that mean? What does that well, mean? Well, I guess I had a, yeah, I had a, I mean, I had a conventional practice. I mean, I, I suppose to step back, I mean, I I found my way into architecture when I was about 22, 23. I felt incredibly old and I had um, gone back to Australia to study. So I hadn't gone to university. I'd gone to art school and I did a foundation. Then I left. I'd done various things in London in the, uh, I guess, late 80s, early 90s and, you know, done bits of construction gone to Australia and I was traveling and um and my eldest child was conceived and I thought you know god I better get my life together I better do something and enrolled in um Sydney College of the Arts as it was then um because I had dual nationality luckily and so I could get my fees paid get a grant paid and um I enrolled to do industrial design and because they, I guess I didn't know what architecture was until in the first week I, I went into a a lecture and it was a, it, the first semester, in fact, was um, cross disciplinary. So it's kind of fashion, you know, industrial interior and architecture and went to a lecture by Glenn Merkert, who had just won the Alvar Alta medal. And, you know, was kind of amazed by what he suggested architecture could be, which is, you know, really modest, simple, low key things that I could relate to that sat in um, landscapes intelligently. And it sort of made sense. And, you know, I, and it wasn't quite as simple as coming out and changing to architecture, but I kind of did, you know, basically it took a few days, but I, I then changed to architecture. And in a way, I really, for the first time in my life, having struggled academically, um, found a, a way of being in the world that made sense to me. 
And I, but Glenn was a, a wonderful teacher in many ways. I mean, I think that it wasn't just the buildings, it was the sort of way he practiced architecture. He worked by himself from his front room, he drew everything himself, and he took on kind of big issues with his buildings. And some of his buildings were incredibly modest. And I, I then, um, this is kind of everything speeded up, but I, I, I came back and finished here in the UK and got, I had to get a job. You know, I left uni on the 20th of June in whatever year it was on the 21st of June, I was working in a commercial practice because it was the only place I could get a job. And I, you know, and I, and I remember thinking, you know, has it, has it come to this, you know, and I, and I got an email, it was supposed to be in the early days of email from um, the Glen Market Masterclass and went back it was just setting up this way of going back and, and studying with Glenn and I and I sort of so I touched base with him again but ultimately I ended up um starting a practice I you know I had I had so little confidence and I and I worked by myself I was kind of I, I'd left this commercial practice by this stage and I was scratching around trying to do bits of work and I and I built my own house because it was cheaper than getting a contractor and we'd had a little bit of money that had come from my my partner's um, mother who had died so we built a house and um sort of set up a practice really on the back of building building the house ourselves for 85 grand and um but but I started to work with somebody else, shared space, and you know, and he asked me to set up a practice with him. And because, you know, although I'd studied Glenn, he worked in a very singular manner. I didn't, in a way, have the confidence that I could set up a business or employ people or do things. And you know, and, and architecture is so kind of formalized and regularized in this country. And I probably felt slightly seduced that he wanted to set up a practice with me. But set up a practice with somebody else, and for six or seven years, had a very conventional practice and um, realised um, that I just didn't want to practice in that way. And I'd been doing more interesting work um, as a teacher and going to the AA and delivering buildings with students as part of the academic programme and teaching in an unusual manner, which was Studio in the Woods. And and so I, I left. I, I left and walked away from my own practice and realised that... It, I wanted what I had called an invisible studio, which was Studio in the Woods, which was where people came together, did a project and dispersed. There was no infrastructure of practice. There was none of that conversation about, um, you know, organisation, employing people. There was none of that um, sort of brand identity. There was no geographical location. There wasn't even an office. There was just an idea about people coming together to do work. And I called it an invisible studio for that reason, that, you know, I wanted a way of doing work that wasn't beholden to all that kind of banal infrastructure of practice. And and so, and I wanted something I couldn't really walk away from and I wouldn't, that, that wasn't something I'd set up. And if it failed, I was left with a kind of office and people and stuff and a brand. It was just a thing that I could do work within and, you know, and, and, and not when I didn't have any work. So that, that's why and how in, in a speeded up over, you know, 20 years of, of why invisible. That's a really interesting uh, idea. I like this idea of the, the banal infrastructure of practice. And I was wondering, so a lot of your work, Studio in the Woods, um, Invisible Studio, and the, the stuff that's presented certainly in the public eye, it's timber built, it's very low carbon, very kind of um, hands-on kind of materials. And this is slightly off piste, but I do wonder whether the kind of infrastructure of the profession, which I find very onerous too, um, is there to enable you to kind of for, use different types of materials. So could, could, you, could you have an invisible studio that worked in concrete or is the kind of structure of the prac of, of the profession there to kind of control, in a way, regularize those complex aspects of architecture, which go beyond timber frame buildings and that kind of thing? Do you know what I mean? It's like to a certain degree, I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the problem with practice is that it's deeply institutionalized. Yeah. And, you know, I and I, you know, for example. I hate getting emails from people saying I am a part one or I am a part two or mm -hmm. and, you know, because it's sort of defining yourself. 
rather than what can you do, what can you bring to it as a co-collaborator? You know, you're defining yourself by the kind of institutions of profession from a very early mm -hmm. age. And there's something about, you know, keeping people down. And there's a sort of presumption around practice that's deeply normalized. And I also felt that, you know, um, I guess when I remember when I left my last practice, which in, in a certain way was a, a sort of small design-led practice that won awards and got published and did the mm -hmm. sorts of buildings that lots of people seem to aspire to. And I remember looking around there when I was in that practice and thinking, you know, that we're just another practice. And as I looked around with me, I saw people who are 15 years younger than me starting practices and being interested in the kind of craft and materials and, and kind of the same old stuff. And I'm, I was like, I just, I just, you know, why is it that architecture is so deeply conservative as an institution compared to you know any other creative discipline there's none of that presumption you know if you're going to make a record if you're a musician if you're going to make a piece of work you're a creative artist there's none of that baggage around how you're supposed to do it you're you know there's the absolute acceptance that you you reinvent that stuff and and it isn't provocative to do it it's just how you are in the world if you're a grown-up Mm -hmm. and and your creative person and I suppose I wanted something that was more agile I didn't particularly want something that was fixed you know mm -hmm. which is in a way the the group of people that work together for life it's like when you start a practice there's an institution that's bounded by a legal entity that's very hard to walk away from and I in my previous practice there were all sorts of directors agreements and shareholders agreements and you know and we didn't have any money it was kind of absurd it wasn't like yeah. we had lots of money and lots of work we just had this sort of absurd cumbersome institution and I just thought you know I just don't want that and I it wasn't even that I knew what else I wanted I just knew I wanted to be agile I knew I wanted to constantly feel like I could make it up or change direction or change mm. tack and 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 so that was one of the things that I really held on to and it took a long time to work out how to do it and I I did sort of try employing people and that didn't work it made me unhappy and you know so so but I think the back to your question about could you do a studio in the woods in concrete and how do you upscale it I think that what I really enjoy is that you can deal with all sorts of different issues as you know as an architect as a someone who does I guess have a practice is that you know you don't always do the same things and what I the buildings that you referred to or the ways of doing or defining space or using materials that you referred to, which are the studio in the woods model or are this, this, this studio that I'm speaking from and are the buildings that I've done in the landscape around this studio and, and some of the other, they are in a way, one way of making buildings. And I think of them as sort of, you know, three dimensional sketches that are super informative for me and begin to help me navigate the world of other ways of doing things where, you know, we have to make a living and have to work for clients out there in the world. These aren't just self-indulgent self kind of, you know, um, uh, sort of, you know, creative sketches. What, what, what they are is that it helps me articulate what I'm interested in in um, practice generally. And so the, what I learned from these buildings is um, that that doing buildings in ways where you don't predefine and control everything from the outset as a single and lone designer yeah. is really interesting for example there are lots of other things so so you know if you if you take that as an example if you upscale that it doesn't necessarily mean okay so you work in timber and you make it up as you go along and you're working with students and there's a loose roadmap for doing things what it means is something entirely different it's, it's a process that is then contingent on wider sort of social structures or um or things that come out of a of a place, you know, so that a big project that we did do, which is something called East Key and watch it, it's the gallery, it was seven million pounds, it took eight years, you know, we absolutely, and it was kind of made partly out of concrete, we absolutely didn't um, make the building up as we went along, but the whole process was so contingent. And instead of the contingencies being in the materials and the timber and the cutting and the students, they were actually in the politics and the social fabric of what we're doing and how it would work in a multi-handed way, what would leave open for other people to fill in. So it's a similar idea about looseness and contingency, just hugely upscaled. And the contingencies become different issues, if you see what I mean, rather than being about the materials themselves. That word use, uh, looseness is really interesting. You you. So normally with these podcasts, someone's got a book or something like that. But you, I, so I went and found your doctoral thesis on the Reading website. Oh my God, I thought I'd be buried. I, I was, I was a no, 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 no. They um... never disappear. Um, which is really, I mean, 
fantastic. Uh, I tried downloading it on the train, but it's uh, it nearly killed the train. But th there's this line in it where you talk about, so you're talking about co-design, and this is something that you mention on your website. And I kind of want to know a little bit what of how you interpret co-design, because yeah. I think it's where my heart lies in terms of architecture as well. Um, and, and the way that you describe the project, is it watch, watch it? Um, watch it, yeah. Yeah, uh, this idea of sometimes the co-design doesn't occur within what we might describe as the aesthetic or formal processes, but occurs within the kind of negotiation of relationships. I, th I think that's yeah. very intuitive. But you say in, in, your, in your, your thesis that, that the process that you describe is a method for how an artifact can, collective, can be collectively discovered rather than willed. And I thought that was a really lovely idea. There's this idea of a looseness that, that as you design and all and your practice is obviously deeply embedded with making, we could talk about design making tensions as well. But this idea that through the production, design, social, making and living in, there's this discovery yeah. of an architecture. And I, I just thought that that was very, very elegantly put. What does discovery yeah, what does that mean? mean in that context? Well, I think, so, you know, there is this rhetoric that when we're at architecture school, it's, it's or when I was at architecture school, you know, and, and, and to a certain extent, I think it's the sort of, the, the rhetoric or the dogma that still exists that, you know, we conceive of things in our mind mm -hmm. and they're kind of fixed and we imagine this, this form so absolutely that we then communicate it clearly, clearly mm -hmm. to others with a set of sort of binary instructions that, yeah. you know, is, is, is our way of being uh, as architects. And it's, it's so strong and it's so, it's so sort of repugnant. It's sort of, you know, the, the, <clears throat> Anne Rand's anti-hero Howard Rorkian kind of way of being in the world where you you are terrified of your vision as a genius as a sort of usually white middle-aged genius male being kind of conf being, being sort of challenged by the world and if, if something happens to it it's the world that's wrong not you and I suppose also you know there's this question if I'm not Glenn Merker and I'm not Corb you know, and and you're just another guy doing architecture. What is your place if you know you're not? I'm not going to be called. I'm not going to be Glenn Merker. I'm not even going to be you know whoever. So, what's your way of doing buildings that's interesting? Because I can't make another you know Ronchamp or you know because you know uh, and and so you know how can you work in a way that's interesting? And I suppose you know what I what I realized through doing Studio in the Woods was that sitting around scratching our heads going so what are we going to do wasn't mm -hmm. very interesting it wasn't very productive and i found that conversation quite boring yeah. but when we started to work and we used um a, a way of making and using materials um in a manner that was much more open to people diving in and doing things and changing things and adapting that was really, really interesting. And there are many, many ways and configurations that, of that. And you know, at its, I suppose also at this time, you know, I was probably deeply interested in rural studio where I loved this idea of, you know, three or four students making, a, making the same building in parallel. And someone would bolt something to the side of someone else's building and kind of cannibalize it or, you know, it was, and, and actually there was no place to be precious about your idea. And and I realized that as I did Studio in the Woods more and more and more, what I would try and do would be invent a kind of system of working. I would say, uh, what is the least I can put in place? And typically it's a kind of kit of cheap, simple kit of parts that's that's that comes that's very simple to use, low tech, cheap. You know, it's kind of it's a stack of thin timber and it, it's then bendy. And because people that there don't really use tools or haven't used tools much or don't want to use power tools, what can we do with it? Let's just think that we can maybe bind it together or use hand. You know, there's a simple sort of definition of a project that that then allows us to get sort of started. And and then um, and each that's the whole thesis actually ultimately is about what you put in place mm. to allow that looseness to happen. And, you know, and it also stemmed from building a studio where I'd come from working, 
as a design make tutor for the AA in an environment that was deeply, deeply conservative. You know, it was jocks with hammers looking at things and talking about what they looked like and controlling what they looked like. Absolutely. The kind of robotic construction and all that kind of stuff and coding everything. And so what I what I did when I built this studio was just, you know, have a chat with some people that lived in in the edges of the woods, my neighbor, a few mm-hmm. people who were just kind of, you know, ordinary rural resourceful people who didn't care about architecture, didn't care about making, didn't have any interest in in the way that we were supposed to do things. So we just kind of started a conversation around I might take these trees out and use them to build a building and what would it be like? And, you know, and consequently, the the build this building was built by people who had no regard for the kind of authority of how a stud is supposed to be set out or, you know, or whatever. But there was a system put in place by the trees we took out that were cut to a certain dimension because it made sense because of the trees we had. They then just fitted a building around it with me. And the studs are at 600 centres, 200 centres, sometimes 500 centres other times. There were bits of bracing in strange places that made absolute sense to them. And that was the system that allowed this studio, I would say, the language of it at a fairly detailed level to be collectively discovered Mm. in studio in the woods it's something different because it might be a kind of simple mat that gets pulled up by people into a kind of one you know thing that you collectively discover and each person feels they're influencing it and designing it and and it happens it's sort of in real time rather than uh um, what it do is think of a shape and then is everyone happy should we start making kind of work so this designing idea this designing making binary and you you mentioned this again in your thesis and I think it's obviously very clear in the way that you're talking about it now and the way your work has Mm -hmm. developed Mm -hmm. is that you do not see um, a distinction between designing and making there's a kind of medieval quality to what you're proposing a kind of idea that and perhaps a vernacular idea an informal idea that yeah, that designing is something that emerges. In certain context, it, it's absolutely. an emergent concept. It's an emergent property of materials of and acting on materials. Absolutely. I mean, at its best, absolutely. And I think Tim Ingold, anthropologist, writes about this beautifully. That you know, creative processes are emergent. They are emergent. You discover them. I mean, at you know, we you've mentioned David Pye to me offline. And, you know, David Pye is interesting because, you know, he talks about the kind of, you know, the awareness of the grain of the material. So he's super interested in, in material and, you know, in a way in a in a in, in craft speak, you could discover a project through the kind of grain of the project rather than willing it to form. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's very difficult for us as architects. And, you know, we're not craftspeople. I certainly are, I'm not a craftsperson. I'm very bad at making. And and I'm also interested in lots of other things. And I suppose that the grain that I use is the people, the stuff, the, the stuff of life that's kind of around me. And ultimately, I would say, you know, as a designer, it makes the work more interesting because it's far more interesting to have all this stuff happening that you weave into a project rather than stuff that I alone can pre-imagine you know because all these other influences that you can abandon if you need you can bring in if you need you know that's really really interesting stuff and i would say ignore that at your peril if you think that the little world inside your head is more interesting than all of that then i would say you have a very diminished project and and i think you know and i would also say that architects are drawn to diminished projects because it's stuff within their control you know you Mm -hmm. look at you know Mesian buildings are actually quite diminished in their rhetoric. It doesn't mean they're not interesting or or in some ways kind of beautiful, but they're quite diminished as a sort of idea. It's a it's a grid within a grid within a grid, and this idea about purity and control and absoluteness and you know there's a priori strict kind of you know codified ways of doing things. I think you know I'm not I'm not interested in that stuff. I'm I I like the surprise and delight that you get when other things challenge your preconceptions get woven into a project, and at best. Absolutely. You discover those things. You choreograph those things as they happen, as you work, as you as you emerge from or or as you move through that process of making building. It doesn't mean they're always like that, because I do have to, you know, I make a living as as an architect largely now. It's been really hard at times. But, you know, as part of that, you have to predefine everything and often with time frames that are that are super defined so you know then 
I would argue that you work with different things. And that's why I talk about Watch It quite a lot, because, you know, when we built Watch It, it, it felt it had to be an open grained building that was, although we were predefining things because it had to go to planning, of course, and had to, you know, had to have a fully resolved scheme to RIBA stage four before it would get uh -huh. funded. You know, what it was, though, was an open building that was an invitation to other people to fit things in, to change it, to adapt it, to make it whatever they wanted in a very unprecious manner, because the things we put in place were the kind of right things. Whereas, you know, at its the other extreme, of course, is something like the Reliance Control Building, which was Richard Team 4's first building in Swindon, which was so strict that when the client said, could I have a window in my office? They went, well, no, of course you can't, because there's, we've got a facade that has the language and you can't put an opening in it because it's a panel. And panels don't have openings. And so of course, he just went to, you know, the equivalent of B&Q and put an opening in it. And, you know, and to their credit, they photographed it as an example of how closed their system was. So, you know, designing and making isn't just the thing that emerges at your fingertips. It's also an ongoing process about how something that you do can engage with the world. And I would think that every project is different in terms of how it engages with the world and, it, and is informed by the world. Yeah. And that making, the act of making, mm. then distributes the possibility of design into a broader public. Because if if design is this esoteric, professionalized um, thing that people with letters behind their names, after their names, get to do, mm. making isn't. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by this idea of us being a sort of post-creative society when you look at sort of the number of B and Qs which are, in fact, a sign of a profound creativity, actually. Everybody who gets hold of a house with any kind of license to, to, to change it, either through ownership or good, or good landlordism, will, um, will, will do very, very creative things. Um, and so this making, yeah. to me, from what I've seen of you and, and, and as I understand it, is, is both a way of, yeah, granting voice and agency to, to the recipients or the people that buildings are being imposed upon or um, collaborating with. But also it's a way of getting people to interrogate and understand their worlds, isn't it? It's like a, making is a very useful way of pe getting people to know the character of the materials that surround them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're, the skill of a designer is how you open up the conversation to those people so they can mm -hmm. take part in it as equals and as people with agency. And mm -hmm. typically, you know, we disempower people. So it's like, you know, on a building site, there's a kind of strict hierarchy. Mm -hmm. and, you know, even in an architect's office, there's a strict hierarchy. And there are skilled makers, there's not so skilled makers. And why I'm so suspicious of craft is the kind of baggage around skilled making. And I, you know, of course, I like things that are made well, but I'm also interested in things that are made badly, if it means somebody can express an idea. And and I think what what I, you know, the case study that I use in um in Studio in the Woods is is actually um, you know, Kate, who I work with and 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 Janny, they I I looked at how they ran group projects in Studio in the Woods. And what I was really interested in is how all of these people that came from diverse backgrounds, some had no experience of making, some were architects, some had never, you know, really even thought about what architecture was, some were older, younger, you know, um, from all over the place. How was it that they could buy into this making a piece of architecture as absolute equals with absolute agency to control, you know, things on their terms if they wanted how could they feed into that and have such agency and it felt amazing to watch and really what that was was Kate Janney didn't really care about um what um the building should be at the beginning they trusted that something interesting could emerge from this kind of conversation if they put in place a simple a simple way of getting started which was an idea about what they're going to look at an idea about what they're going to explore and an idea about what what technologies they had, which was usually pretty low tech, because if you have things like cable ties, hand saws, bits of timber, rope, people can be invited quite easily into that. If you have a specialist fabrication lab, you know, the Bartlett or the AA, people can't go into that unless you yeah. have years of coding knowledge and all the rest of it, you know. Yeah, years of coding knowledge and a really good insurance plan as well, yeah. <laughs> which I think is really important. But this idea... Yeah. It speaks to this this notion that this word that's thrown around of of empowerment and your obviously your your thesis talks about empowerment and you've produced lots of material people can find online 
about this, um, videos and whatnot. I mean, what do we mean by empowerment? And it's a big, big question. It's like, what do we mean by co-design? What do we mean by empowerment? And, and obviously it means that certain things in healthcare and it means other things in, I don't know, uh, politics, but it, what does it mean specifically in terms of architecture? Um, what are we doing when we empower people as architects? I think it's a really difficult question. Thank you. I mean, I use the word, as you know, in, <laughs> in my thesis. <laughs> and um, it, it's it's a really hard question because it's a loaded uh, word mm -hmm. and it's used in such a lame way quite often. And also it's, and it's quite dangerous to think, oh, I, you know, I, I can do this thing that will empower you. It's really quite dangerous to presume that, you know, we have sort of in a way, you know, the the authority to empower. I mean, but I think at, at best what I think I meant by it, and I think there was a piece in the thesis where I did define it in, in certain ways, you know, does it hand over a, a kind of agency to people? Does it allow people to grow and become stronger? Does it allow people to self-determine and do things on their own terms rather than, and, and use judgment and use these all these other things to um, to define a project? And, you know, and, and if I look at those things, that then makes sense in the context of binary instructions written by architects for other people to make do not empower people. They cannot use their own judgment. They cannot become stronger through the process and discover things through the project because they are told absolutely in a binary manner what to do. So then, of course, you have to start looking at what are the instructions that you give to people if you want to invite them in? How subtle are they? What's strongly stated? What is loosely stated? And all of the things that you need to do, because I think, you know, what doesn't happen is that you go into a room and suddenly this magic process comes out and everyone co-choreographs it and it's super happy. What you really do need to do as a as a designer is is actually be immersed in the kind of awareness, the sensory awareness of what people can do, what people need to hear, and what people need in a very kind of subtle way. And often, you know, the simply defined idea that binds people together and sets people on a journey that allows them to harness their own tacit skills, their own tacit knowledge, and come to a project as an equal to someone around them who may overtly have more experience. That, in a way, is a kind of empowerment, I think, mm -hmm. um, as well. But like all of these things, architecture is a moving target. That's what's so interesting about it. All of these words are moving targets and easy to kind of to, to, to sort of shoot down and move. You know, so their attempts to start opening up um, conversations about what else architecture can be, because you know, if it's only what shape and colour it is, it gets really boring really quickly. Mm. And, you know, it's not to say shapes and colours aren't interesting, but they're only so interesting. And it's sort of like, what else is there? You know, mm. what else is there with an architecture that kind of keeps us going, I think? What is there distinct about the action of collective making, you think, that is that is specifically empowering? Because I assume you do, because you do it so much. Um, and I, I think, think it, and I yeah. think it is as well. But I would like, I would really like to know, like, what it is i think it's uncertain i think you know i think in a way i mean tim tim ingle writes beautifully about the kind of creative process and creativity isn't just you know picasso in a room doing you know it's there's something about the everyday uncertainty of life you know that mm. is that is really i mean this conversation is on it we have no idea where it's going to go what's going to happen and i think you know true creativity is in a way you know, kind of uncertainty and being open to the uncertainty about what might happen and then being able to respond, adapt, dodge it, be agile, move around, you know. And and I think that the design, a design process that that um involves people other than yourself has more opportunity for those conversations with the world, you know, and has more opportunity to make projects that are that are less scrutable than than the projects that are still so dominant in our rhetoric, which is that of the, the the simplified and purified modern project. You know, and when I I remember looking at an old building once, I was in the Lake District or Cumbria, Eden Valley with my brother, having gone to see my father, and we're coming back across the moors and we saw this, you know, series of old buildings. And I, you know, jumped out and I was photographing them. And and my brother, who is an anthropologist, said, you know, what is it you like about old buildings? Is it that they're so inscrutable? And I and I I I think I said absolutely, you know, that is it, because what I love about old buildings is you can't see when they began, when they finished, who did what, what happened. But there's a kind of thing that binds them together. And when we look at architecture, you know, architecture starts at a certain point and it finishes at a certain point and it's fixed at a certain point when it's finished and it's photographed and it's put in a magazine and it's like that forever. 
but but actually you know the world that affects a project is immeasurably more interesting than than the fixed bit of the project and consequently i think you know if you look at elementals work in chile you know what's super interesting about their work is how they built half a they built an invitation for other people to do something mm -hmm. and for me you end up with the best some of the best urban fabric in the world you know when you look at what people have done to buildings and how they've appropriated them and made them their own and you know if you look through cities we've got no problem with cities being adapted and changed and developed and moved around if there's the kind of underlying sort of system that allows that to happen you know so in bath the, you know which is the town that i live near you know the backs of terraces are infinitely more interesting than the fronts of terraces because they've been moved around to change and adapted and and i think that the kind of weaving in the fabric of life where there's an opportunity for discovery is much more interesting than that kind of singular purposeful controlled you know closed system and richard senate writes about this in the ethics of the city that you know an open city allows all these interactions to kind of happen you know in, yeah. in james jacobs world or you know good interesting clever intelligent cities allow that to happen closed cities don't allow that to happen they're fixed they're ordered they're defined and controlled and those kind of chance encounters get banished and i and i and i think the collective is is conversation the collective is is the kind of breath of life it it, it you know and i think you know maybe if you if you ask me you know, that's the kind of big professional manifesto i suppose but why you know i think the subtext of the question is why is it interesting for me and i think you know i think there's several things i mean i came from a relatively modest family that was quite kind of neat and quite ordered and you know it was quite it felt quite diminished there were kind of two kids my brother was away a lot and i was at home a lot and i and, and so part you know i wanted for me you know i have quite a big family i have four kids and i i love the kind of chaos of life i love being i like my domestic environment being challenged my mother was somebody who was super controlling. And, you know, she's kind of woman, you know, uh, we, you know, um, middle class, I'm afraid we had a cleaner. I was sent out, you know, I had to go out when the cleaner came because my mother wanted, you know, we had rooms that you weren't allowed to sit in and use. And, you know, I guess I thought that that's not a very interesting way of being in the world. And I remember going back, when I went back to Sydney in um, uh, about um, 2001 to do this Glen Merkert masterclass that I've alluded to, I went to stay in in, in a house that was owned and I think designed by my tutor actually he was house sitting I think but, but he designed it and it was it was a white house with kind of white stuff and it was super ordered and super controlled and I remember putting my bag down my pen leaked and you know he was frantically paranoid and I couldn't move anything couldn't touch anything I couldn't be in the house then I went to a house by Richard Laplastery that you had to get to by boat and it's kind of like an exploded campsite and it was so kind of generous in spirit and he lived there in one room that all opened up there was no furniture he had his mother's old chair in the corner he had one mattress that they all climbed onto at night you know him and his three kids and his partner and there was such a kind of generosity of spirit that was so kind of intoxicatingly romantic mm -hmm. about all of the life happening in in one place that I think that's a process that I enjoy rather than the sterile and barren kind of single loan designer trying to kind of keep everything for themselves. Yeah, that, that, and, but we do this with the education system. I actually think we, we, I mean, we attract, because of the nature of our education system, I think we attract a certain type of person that has that, it's not megalomaniacal, but certainly that desire for a sense of control. I remember speaking to one architect, I, I, um, I worked for, who expressed a, a genuine admiration, a genuine sort of, dare I say it, erotic energy towards the idea of getting other people to dig holes for them, which I thought was very strange. It jumped right out at me. But, but I, but I have, there, there's a couple of things. I mean, as in, as in um, the, the puppet, as in having yeah. people out yeah, there. Yeah. 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 I, th I, I mean, I was, wow. I, I didn't realize until that point that that was a thing. And I think I, I've increasingly realized that it is actually very very central to the, the the normative practice of the contemporary architect and you've talked about this issue around practice there's this another quote from from your your thesis remove the artificial uh, you, the design making process removes the artificial break between designing and making that most contemporary contracts require so it's even this kind of incredibly neat distinct discrete way of working is actually almost um because of our professional status it's almost um unavoidable you to keep your letters almost unavoidable. Exactly. yeah 
And I think I think that's a very. I think... And I think also, you know, we're terrified of risk, terrified of risk, terrified, but also terrified of loss of control. I mean, I think that you know the yeah. the it deeply ingrained in our education system is that one of singular control. I mean, I think elsewhere in the thesis, I sort of you know talk about Bob Shield talking about you know the design process is a series of negotiated transactions. So every time you hand over. A, you know, a set of drawings or something or communicate an instruction to somebody else you negotiate a transaction mm -hmm. but that transaction in his terms is one that is right with the opportunity for loss mm -hmm. so every time in his mind you get handed over something um to some you hand over something to somebody else there's an opportunity for that idea to be diminished because yeah. of the way they interpret it. so the way that you set yourself up is to try and control something so perfectly there's no opportunity for loss and in bob shields design mate world that's robotic construction because you could just program something in and it does it cuts out he called he cuts out the middleman and i am really interested in what happens if you invite the middleman in you know what happens if, instead of seeing them as as places of loss what happens if you see them as places of opportunity or places of gain what happens mm -hmm. if the design process can bring things in, not keep things out. And yet, as you say, contractually, it's almost impossible because we kind of banish risk. And, and how, how can we, you know, where are the contingencies then and, and those opportunities in kind of normative practice? And I don't just mean the kind of model of the, the office. I mean, you know, the way that buildings are procured are manners that try and minimise risk, minimise opportunities for change. You know, it's a highly complex process also making a building now you know i think regulator regulations i think you know environmental control everything has got much much, much tighter where are those opportunities you know and um it's it's interesting and i and and i think you know i think in a way we we keep trying to sniff them out well, i suppose i keep trying to sniff them out but i but i i think you know it's hard to find them those opportunities in projects that have a time scale and a, and a and a professional client and and so on. Mm. Um, a bit of a tangent, I suppose. There were two questions that I I want to ask. One is the way you're describing your practice and the intention of your practice, and those two things are generally speaking they overlap in everybody's life, but they never completely conform with each other, do they? they never completely overlap. It seems to me to be quite a phenomenological. I was thinking like, what is the undergirding philosophy or ethic? Well, they're two separate questions, I suppose. What is the undergirding philosophy that has guided your work? Who did you read? Who inspired you? Because there is a, a sense, this idea in terms of the making that through the making process, the world is um, revealed. It, 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 uh, it unfolds in front of you in a kind of, um, yeah, in, the sense of a Heideggerian sense or a Merleau-Ponty sense or, or, or um, yeah, a general phenomenological sense. And I really like yeah. this idea, I but mean, I, wonder really whether, I wonder whether you did have, like, was there somebody that you read and you thought, yes, that, rather than looking at, a, say, a high modernist philosophy and thought, keep it neat, keep it tidy? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in a way, I think... Um... I mean, you know, I have to say my my wife thinks it's kind of absurd because I'm so clearly kind of middle class. But I did grow up in, you know, the 70s and early 80s where, you know, there was it was absolutely accepted that if you wanted to make music, you could you didn't have to play and you didn't have to sing and you could use you could mistreat um, instruments um, to explore feelings. And it was Marky e. Smith from The Fall who said that in particular. And I was kind of, it was so, you know, the, I mean, you know, at a base level, the musicians that I were, it, were, were interested in, and they were, you know, usually early punk pioneers such as the remote, they simply couldn't play. But there was such a desire to explore the world through the language of what they did that they just had the total disregard for technique. And, you know, technique is so dominant in architecture, you know, and, and I do come from a very middle class family where, you know, I am the only person in my family that um, didn't go to Cambridge, you know, and I didn't mean my parents or my brother or my cousins or my uncles, my aunts, my grandparents. And it's and I was deeply shamed for not having followed that path. And, you know, my mother's funeral, my father said, your mother never forgave you for not going and I, and I but I and I and I suppose I I was deeply suspicious deeply deeply suspicious of 
um, a kind of received way of doing things. And so when I did come into architecture, although to a certain degree I was seduced by Glenn Merkert, you know, in a way he's deeply conventional. In a way, his his outlook is deeply conventional. He doesn't like disorder. You know, his buildings are quite singular. Um, you know, where did I look for inspiration, I guess? And I suppose I, you know, it, I, I think, you know, I was deeply suspicious of, you know, I guess, um, uh, most phenomenological readings that are mainstream within architecture because they were received with what was such kind of reverence you know and they reminded me I guess of Peter Zumta you know or people that were the kind of high priests of sensory kind of you know experience of buildings and I you know I, and I and I just resisted that and, and I suppose the reason I've scratched around with sticks in the woods doing these kind of crappy sheds is that you know I I, I was I was really interested in what what do you what can you do if you didn't go to Cambridge? You're not lookable as you. You don't conform to the kind of the narrative of technique and and the kind of whole way within architect with which architecture is consumed. Mm. You know, and and actually, you know, you can still find beauty and extraordinary phenomenological experiences in the in the kind of the most ordinary of spaces and you know and I would argue that you know my parents you know as I told you they they didn't couldn't understand that that even it wasn't even just the Ramones or Marquis but they couldn't understand the Beatles were music or Bob Dylan was music it was kind of and, and yet you know of course in in a in a in a distorted piece of you know, immersive soundscape made by you know somebody who can't play there's extraordinary transcendental beauty mm. and yet there's no technique there's no received baggage there's no kind of culture of you know doing things the right way so I always resisted the, the kind of readings, but some things absolutely did make sense. I mean, I, it isn't a text, but, you know, Rural Studio absolutely made sense mm. because it was scrappy and experimental and, and and kind of, you know, made up. I mean, Lars Spoybrek has written an incredible book about process in architecture. And he writes about, you know, the link between kind of Ruskin and the Gothic and, and in and his mind, kind of, you know, parametric form, which actually I'm not really interested in, but he describes Describes so beautifully how the Gothic was so open to kind of you know the rude kind of you know crude as in rude you know interpretations of the kind of um, you know the work people work men traditionally of course that were on site that could within a system improvise make things use their agency and I suppose he was really I mean Lars Spoybrick felt kind of extraordinary when I read that I mean I think you know Jeremy Till has written very cleverly about. Um, the absurdity of architecture, the kind of absurd conceit with which architecture is prone to, um, you know, become so kind of pompous and so kind of, you know, it, it's so much about, you know, the architecture, the architect being the hero, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it just feels so pompous and so absurd mm -hmm. architecture, you know, and, and I suppose, so generally all of the influences have been from without, you know, from outside, from outside architecture, you know, where there's very little of that pomposity in mm -hmm. music, in art, in food, whatever, whatever the world outside architecture kind of is, you know. There's, um, yeah, I mean, it, I was going to ask as a sort of associated question, like what is the ethic behind it? If there's not a, undergirding philosophy and I and I do agree with you you know we get dominated I've, I've always been struck by my own self of, of, of how I um when I understand something which is very rare in you know some uh, philosophical text I immediately believe it so if I've always felt that Martin Heidegger got given far too much credit simply because he was yeah. the most understandable yeah. of the 20th century continental philosophers but yeah. um I was wondering if there is a sort of but I think it's quite clear Bruno that an ethical okay Bruno Latour let's try that so Bruno well I think you know we've never been modern is really key and really important because again he kind of dismantles the whole kind of purification of the the modern you know um uh, the, I guess modern thinking the sense that if you reduce things down to their binary components you can kind of make sense of them and mm -hmm. and I think you know the world, as he defines, it, is a series of interlinked and overlapping spheres and worlds and disciplines. Mm -hmm. And you know, he writes so beautifully about that in um, "We Have Never Been Modern." And yet, you know, so he's sort of saying that you know, it's such an absurd conceit that we invent our future. We have to invent the future, and it's the kind of thing that always is modern. And also, we distinguish ourselves between our us and people who are 
pre-modern, you know, because they were their thinking was confused about everything from kind of science to architecture to whatever else. And Bruno Latour writes so beautifully about the world as a non-modern place of, of interlinked and overlapping, um, uh, um, you know, um, territories, I guess. So that he has been absolutely key, I think. Yeah. I mean, we've. I've talked. I did a conversation with Albania Yaneva about his work around actor network theory, mm-hmm. and I suppose where your work seems to me to to move beyond that is that rather than just thinking of the world as a a kind of actors and tools, it's actors, tools, mm-hmm. emotions, mm-hmm. techniques, processes. It's a very kind of. It's a, a very hybrid very postmodern, yeah. very complex world. Yeah. It seems yeah. to embra- embrace complex. Yeah. Well, hybridizes it. Yeah, and, and, and uses that yeah. as its strength rather than as, as, as something to resolve before yeah. we act. You say the action exactly. occurs through the complexity. Exactly. exactly. I mean, that's, that's in a sense the philosophy, I guess, is that, you know, that, that um, you know, it, it is through the kind of hybridized worlds of interactions that yeah. that things happen and um, things are discovered that and, and also that the world doesn't need to make sense. And there's such a lot of kind of sense making in architecture where, yeah. um, you know, <clears throat> and such the sort of, you know, such sort of dominance of the logical, you know, the reductive sort of. Um, you know, tendency, as as we've said, to purification, and and I think you know, r- you know, Bruno Latour's world is is immeasurably less diminished than that when he, he allows us to kind of bask in the world as kind of hybridized set of, you know, um, uh, different, um, you know, uh, overlapping spheres that that I I think for me is immensely um uh more because i mean i think also you know i i suppose i resisted having a, a manifesto i mean i remember even in my last practice you know somebody saying what it was, so what are we about what do we do and i'm like god i don't know you know i don't i don't really i don't i mean i i think i've always resisted um saying i'm interested in this thing because as soon as i start to define it i start to kind of limit it and it, it, in a way i think i'm interested in lots of things i'm interested in um, you know, other things as as well as architecture. And I try and do those things with architecture. And I think, you know, I think I I, I have resisted the, the sort of desire to try and um present my thinking as a as a kind of um you know a, a, as a as a manifesto, I think. Um, do you think do you think though to be taken seriously within architecture? Yeah, you need to you n- taken seriously by who though? I would argue Ask. by by the profession itself. Yeah, which is the which for most architecture people involved in architecture is significant. Yeah, you need to be able to be sort of reduced down to a cipher of a of a thing. So Mises like this and. Glenn Murcutt's like this, and 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 I imagine Glenn Murcutt yeah. deeply balked at the idea of you know when he got the Pritzker Prize, it must have been for a series of things that perhaps he didn't even recognise. And 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 in a way, if you don't allow yourself yeah. to be de- defined in that very modernist way, because I think modernity is characterised by this desire to draw lines around things. It's it's genius, but I think it's yeah. also the reason why it fails. Yeah. Um, that that as an architect, yeah. we need to. Allow- oh, you do this, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, and it's, I think you know what I've what I've been interested. In. Sorry, after you. Yeah, it's like it's like you know, no, no. Well, what I what I'm interested in is that you know, yes, we do do scratchy buildings in the woods. And we make them up as we go along. We also do other things, and I guess you know the the other the question for then is what next? Because of course you know I don't want just to carry on doing buildings in the woods and scratching around because that's not you know that that's I've I've done it and I want to expand that and I think not necessarily make it bigger and grander, but, you know, you want to move, you want to keep moving into new territories because of course, if your life is a book, you want to keep, you know, going forward and not quite knowing what the next chapter is. And I think the the problem with architecture is that it doesn't typically allow that. And architects who have resisted that, um, you know, uh, probably 
um, uh, less recognized because I think, you know, the world of architecture loves sort of limiting what people do. Glenn does that, you know, as you said, Corb did this, but actually Corb could get away with it and keep changing because he was a kind of genius, but most of us can't do that. And, you know, Corb, Corb had, you know, five phases, but I, you know, I, I really, I really think also it, the danger is that even in doing that, we kind of, we 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 add to the kind of pomposity that architecture has any kind of meaning. I mean, I think that you know, in the in the world of making buildings, which is ninety eight percent, presumably or probably ninety eight point ninety nine point something percent, aren't defined by by um, architects, uh, aren't made by aren't, you know, they're not designed by architects, you know. That none of that stuff matters. They're just there. They just exist. They just change. They just adapt. They haven't defined their designers. You know, and as soon as as architects, we dive in and start, you know, revering them as bits of vernacular. Again, it kind of falls apart. Because yeah, yeah. what you do with that, it limits it. And I think the world outside of architecture doesn't need that kind of simple definition. And I think, you know, and I think, you know, in a way, I think for me, I might, I might, I might just sort of stop doing architecture. And it's not to say I won't, I won't carry on doing some buildings but I think you know the world of architecture where you do a building it's received in the first, it gets judged against work work you've done previously it gets published by somebody that you know wants to write I mean you know that whole it's like it's it's so sort of limiting I think um and and I think it's so belittling I suppose yeah. you know it's so kind of I, I say it's so humiliating for grown-up people to have their lives and work reduced in in such sort of literal ways to things that have to fit certain kind of categories of stuff you know i i was wondering there's that i mean i want i don't want to, ha to take take too much more of your time but there's kind of two questions on on my mind one is that you have expressed i think very beautifully and very um it's very interesting to to try and get my head around the kind of mind the kind of person uh that um produces work like this. Um, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not pretending to be a psychologist, but I, do you think it requires a certain type of person to be the kind of architect you are? Because you are, um, because there are other architects that I've spoken to who have, I think, because I can't do it, rather heroically been incredibly diligent in the unfolding of an architectural identity to themselves and have curated in a way uh, uh, a backstory which gives them this status. They, they've pursued that, that's something that was meaningful to them. And I, 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 find it, um, I find it impressive because I couldn't do it. I'm much more, uh, mm. s s I, I would say I've, I've probably got ADD or something along those lines, you know, it's got to be something new every day. Otherwise I, you know, kind of get, a little frustrated do you think there is a certain type of mindset which would which which is required to do what you do i think so i think so i mean i think i think so i mean i don't have you know um a color-coded sock drawer and you know i i i i am quite chaotic about certain things and our you know our house is a, a tip and i and i and i i guess I guess it's the type of person that doesn't need or want to control the world. And I, you know, if I look at all of those people and I, you know, I love some of them. I mean, Neil McLaughlin or, you know, even Glenn or, you know, Foster, they are all control freaks. They all want to make the world into something that approximates, you know, uh, an image that they have of themselves and, and an image of, of order. And I, and I think that, you know, I, and I think it's a kind of, you know, so that's partly why going back to one of your first points that our people, a certain type of people, person becomes an architect because they can navigate that whole way of think thinking and that whole sort of you know system that encourages that type of person, which is you know the the doing well academically, the knowing which boxes to tick, typically doing kind of maths and sciences, getting into an architecture school, conforming to a system, then moving through it with a set of kind of boxes, and and then giving people what they want that fits a certain sort of way of making space that's received with a certain kind of reverence that has its origins not just in the modern movement but in kind of classical architecture and you know all of that stuff is about kind of authority and and control and i think there are people that do get off on that stuff and and i think you know and and i think 
because of the sort of background that I've described to you, where I where where I, I resisted quite a lot of that stuff. That's probably probably why uh, the, the, you know, and I think it comes back to probably a type of person that enjoys the the opportunities that like the the unexpected, the looseness, the chaos, the mess, the disorder. All of that stuff, I would suggest, you know, uh, if if I think about other architects I know who are interested in that kind of, they're typically people who aren't control freaks. You know, they're people who are open to the next encounter. Whereas I suspect that Norman Foster, he's probably a very interesting man, but I think that he probably tries to limit the scope of the project. Whereas, you know, I think with us, we are trying to look at what, what, what could the project possibly be? You know, where can it go? What could it be? It can be anything. Whereas I think with the Foster project, you probably know pretty early on what it, what it's going to deal with. Mm. Um, I haven't quite answered the question, but I think ultimately it comes down to a kind of patriarchal control. That's mm. the type of person that becomes a successful architect. And it, it's kind of repugnant, really. Well, it's sort of irrelevant to our, to, to our age as well, isn't it? I mean, exactly. you're, you're not going to... You're not going to... Um, I was looking at the House of the Year, the RIBA mm. House of the Year awards, mm. And there was this one that was built in suburban London, mm. oc occupying vernacular languages, mm. Mm. but producing a house that was to all intents and purposes. Oh, hold on a second. Um, hold on a second. <laughs> Sorry, that was uh, that was someone breaking in. Yeah, and and I couldn't quite work out how on earth they had. Um, how on earth these build this type of building can still be being given this kind of or, or suggested yeah. for this kind of award? Essentially, an incredibly lavish project, a mm. two-person house, mm. in a in a very big plot in a very expensive part of the world, mm. extraordinary richness of materials. To be honest, and uh, we're using the same tools, aren't we? We're trying to do the but it, but anyway, we could go on about that. I was just wondering, how do you educate people in this? How do we take this into architecture schools? Um, how do we take your methodology and your uh, pro approach to the world of making and design and bring it to people without, I don't know. say, I for think, example, think... if we haven't got the resources of a space or like the AA, uh, you know, a, a country park and, and, yeah. and uh, lots of money? I mean, I think I do think that the, you know, the indoctrination happens very early on. That there's a design project that is given to one person that they develop um, in, you know, a kind of singular fashion. I, I think that that has to change. And I think that, you know, we learn by doing projects together mm -hmm. and we learn by um, valuing what other people can bring and not being threatened by what other people can bring to mm -hmm. The design, but the education system is such that, you know, the, the, the way that we validate um, students work is by assessing their individual contributions and it, it's really it's really it's such a the whole education system is is very sort of um uh you know dominated by the sense of the individual or being able to assess the individual and i think you know my instinct is we have to move away from from that we have to be able to develop projects together as a kind of you know collective way of of doing things and i think that you know i i think that um part two i mean ge in general terms i mean you know part one is a is a very good sort of introduction to the culture of architecture as was you know in in general terms and i mean i would start you know i mean well one of the ways of starting is in year one where you do things differently from right from the beginning because as soon as you come into year one you are indoctrinated in the culture of architecture who the high priests are what the codes are what the conventions are what the rules are what happens when you break the rules all of that stuff is presented to you very early on as a kind of you know that's the frame so it's very difficult because of course you should get in right at the beginning but i think you know if anything can change it's part two because generally at part two you do more of what you did in part one you just do it a little bit more thoroughly and i think the opportunities in part two to develop buildings together um, or, or um, ways of making space together, or ways of making sort of spatial change together, is is so full of potential because you just don't need to do all that early loan designer stuff, you know. And I, but I think you know we still resist it, and I and I and I think that 
you know, I, I, I really wish I could, Ambrose, give you a, a simple sort of pithy, this is what we need to do thing. But I think the whole system is set up to resist us dismantling it, you know, and and I think maybe we just need to deinstitutionalize it, get rid of the ARB, get rid of the RIBA, stop talking about it as a kind of culture where only we can do certain things. You know, I, I, I simply don't know. And on that bombshell, um, <laughs> I think that's a very fine point to finish on. I think, isn't that, uh, isn't it Socrates who says mm. he's the wisest man in the world because he knows he knows nothing. Maybe this is, maybe this is it. Um, thank you ever so much, uh, Piers. I really enjoyed um, hearing you talk about um, some of your work. Thanks so much for having me and fantastic to, to meet you and chat. What a lovely wonder. Thank you to Piers for being willing and talking so clearly and honestly, and listening too. Please see the podcast description for links to Invisible Studio, his practice, some media articles from recent months on their lovely work, and the gorgeous video Piers made with Laura Mark and Jim Stevenson in 2020 as part of their practice series. And of course, like, subscribe, follow, share. Thanks for listening. Merry Christmas. <laughs>